Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Good morning. Um, welcome to the Karis Daily Live Bible Study. My name is Daniel Bennett, and I'm the Executive Director of Academics here at Karis. And uh, I'll be my own host today, so we'll get started shortly. Uh, Again, if you're watching this live here on February 16th in 2024, this is interactive. So if you um, submit any questions, whatever way you're watching this, I'll get to as many as I can at the end. Also, um, if you'd like prayer um, at any time or if you'd like to partner or find out about more resources, anything like that, you can call our helpline uh, at 719-635-1111. And that is open 24-7 um, all, all year. And so that's a great resource, so you check that out. You can go to awmi.net also, find tons of resources there. So let's go ahead and get started. Today my message or my topic is about receiving words from God. You know, what does the Bible say about prophetic words through other people, right? So receiving a word through a person, not directly from Scripture or, or directly from God to ourselves, but through somebody else. You know, what should we do when someone says that they're giving us a word from God? And so I'd like to talk about kind of what the Word says to do about that. And specifically, you know, this is a, you know, this is a bigger topic. And so specifically, I want to focus on things that could possibly go wrong and how to avoid it. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, my favorite topics, you know, my favorite topic is actually friendship with God, or at least one of my tied for first place favorite topics. I, lo I love thinking about more the positive side of what we can run to, what we can experience, how to walk in victory, practical ways to grow um, and, and uh, mature and be more Christ-like, things like that. But I found that it's also important to, folk, to, uh, to be aware of some of the pitfalls that we might fall into, some of the dangers that, that if we misunderstand or if we are ignorant in some area, that we might unintentionally fall into a ditch on, on one side of the road or the other because uh, we just didn't realize that there was danger in a certain area or, or mistake that we could make. And this is kind of actually the end of a trilogy. I, I didn't intend it this way when I started. but. Uh, a few months ago, I did a message called Giving Five Mistakes to Avoid. And then recently, I did one called, my most recent one was Serving Without Legalism. And now this one is Receiving a Prophetic Word. And basically, these are all three things that I think are amazing. But if they're used incorrectly, they can be very dangerous, right? Giving is amazing. Serving is amazing. And receiving words is amazing. But, um, you know, if they, if they get uh, mixed with guilt or mixed with legalism or they get mixed with manipulation or fear condemnation, things like that, they can become very harmful and very painful. And so, again, I love these topics, but I'm focusing on how to make sure that we enjoy the, the godly version and we don't allow the world, enemy, um, flesh, carnality, legalism, anything like that to infiltrate and ruin it for us. And so, um, I've seen words from God, supposed words from God used in very harmful ways. Um, and many times it's with people with good intentions. And so, again, I, um, again, just to be clear, these are amazing gifts from God. They're amazing things that can be powerful in our lives. But if we, um, if we are ignorant of how they can go wrong, sometimes we can get into situations that can really be harmful in our lives or somebody else's lives. You know, Hosea 4, verse 6 says, My people perish, or my, sorry, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I won't read the whole thing, but just that statement right there, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So you know, if, there's things that if we don't know, if we just stick our head in the sand and we just say, I don't care, I'll just believe whatever I feel like believing, I don't care, you know, I'm not going to think about anything, try to understand anything, there's things that will destroy us, right? Obviously, if you're watching a Bible study, you believe in the value of learning and growing. And so, again, that's kind of the motivation in this. So first of all, before I, I dive in, when I say prophetic words, what do I mean? And so basically, depending on where you come from and your background in church and, and things like that in ministry, um, it, it could have different flavors, right? It, basically, I mean anytime someone implies or says that what they're saying um, to you is a word from God, that it's not just their opinion, it's not just them teaching from the word, they're saying this is a direct word from me, um, through me to you. And it could be someone who is a prophet or claims to be a prophet could be someone just who isn't a prophet, but who has the gift of prophecy. Uh, it could just be a, a normal Christian who has a word for you, who they aren't claiming to be a prophet, anything like that. They're saying, I just feel God's put something in my heart for you. Or it could even be more tame, where someone plays it a bit safer, 
and just say, you know, is it making the big claim of like, I absolutely 100% sure have a word from God for you. It could just be as simple as someone saying, um, I feel impressed to share this with you. You know, I feel God's putting something on my heart for you, things like that. So it could be a wide range. It could also be um, big picture stuff. If someone says, I have a word for the world, or I have a word for the church, or I have a word for America, or a word for your country, things like that. It could be really big like that. So they're claiming that this is a word from God. And again, and, and I'm not saying claiming a bad thing. I'm saying sometimes it may be accurate. Sometimes it may not be. We're going to talk about that. Um, it could be a big word for a lot of people, or it could be a word specifically for you, right? Maybe someone you know, sees you at church and says, hey, I've got a word for you. I want to, I've got to put something on my heart to share with you. Things like that. And again, like I say, there's a great version of these things that can be a real blessing. And so I just want to talk about, well, what should we do to make sure that we, we get the good and we don't get the bad? So again, I've seen great versions. I've seen bad versions. So what I have for you is three tips of things that we should do, um, things that we should consider when we receive a word through somebody else. And I'm just going to jump straight into it. The first one is that we should judge it. And I'm not talking about judging the person, and I don't mean judging in a harsh way. I'm saying evaluating it, saying, is this scriptural? Does this align with scripture? We, we shouldn't believe something just because someone says, well, God said. Was it scriptural? Because God never changes. So if you're telling me something that contradicts the word, I need, I need to judge this. I need to say, no, that's, that can't be totally accurate. It's, it's not accurate at all, or it's, it's at least partially wrong. So God will never contradict his written word. And it's not just about, you know, is there a specific verse about exactly what the person said? But it's also just what God says about his nature, what God says about his character, what he, his promises, the covenant that we're in, things like that. I'll touch on that more in a second. 2 Timothy 3.16 it's great scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's all inspired. It's alive. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. Right? So it's not like the word is just for doctrine. The word's for everything. It's for re reproof. It, the word is, can be used to correct us. It can be used to coach us, to mentor us, to help us grow. So the word of God is alive. The written word of God is alive. And so... Why would God give a word through someone else that contradicts his word when his word, I mean, it goes on in 2 Timothy 3.17 to talk about that this will make us complete, right? It's, it's all that we need, right? We don't need more than that. And so it, God's word is more than enough. And so the words of prophecy should be complementing the word. They should be reinforcing what's in the word, not contradicting it. So it's our job to say, is this scriptural? Is this not scriptural? You know, Acts 17 verse 11 is a great example of this. You know, it's talking about the Bereans, and it says in Acts 17, 11, these were more fair-minded, and some translations say more noble, um, than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So they were being ministered to by apostles, and it says they still, so even when they heard from an apostle who helped write the Bible, it says they still looked in the word to confirm, and the word says that this, this was, they were noble. This was a noble thing for them to do. Even if you heard from Paul himself, you had to, they went back to the Word and said, wow, you're right, this is in the Word. Instead of saying like, well, you're more spiritual than me, I'll just believe whatever you say. No, that's not what God's calling us to do. He's calling us to go to the Word and confirm, is this accurate? Is this true? And so if it's true when Paul's ministering and other people in Paul's group are ministering, how much more is it true when some random person on the street gives us a word from God? Or, or even a friend or a family member, right? If it's true when Paul is ministering, then we should always go to the Word and say, is this accurate? And again, I'm not talking just about a verse that says exactly what the person's talking about, but is it in line with who God is, what He's like, um, what Jesus accomplished on the cross and in His resurrection? Is it in line with the new covenant that we're in and that we're new creations? Is it in line with our new identity? I'll talk about this more in a little bit. Uh, you know, again, is it in sync with what God is like and what God isn't like? Is it, does it sound like God or does it not sound like God? Is it like, no, that's not how God sees me. That's not how God talks to me. This is off. Because you hear a lot of people say, well, God told me this. God told me he hates me. Well, that's not God. That's not scriptural. So some people think the minute someone says God told me, it's end of discussion. Right? God told me this, and so you can't disagree with me because God told me. And if you disagree with me, then you're disagreeing with God, and how dare you? You're questioning my relationship with God. You're questioning God's authority or things like that. And, and we call that playing the God card, right? You may have heard that phrase. Someone plays the God card. And basically it's saying, end of discussion, right? You pull a card out and you say, um, God told me, so you, it is what it is. You can't disagree with me. 
And I strongly disagree with the God card. It does not work on me. Because 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29 says, Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. Let the others judge. We're commanded by the word to judge. Even if it's someone who is a prophet. This isn't talking about false prophets. It's talking about real prophets. It says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Even with real prophets, we're supposed to judge what they say. Is this scriptural? Is this aligned? Are we interpreting correctly? And so when, when someone says to me, God said, blah, 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 my response is, well, God told me to judge what you're saying. Is it scriptural? Is it in sync with the word? Is it in sync with God's nature and God's character? That's not, that's not being disrespectful to someone. That's obeying God. He said, you're supposed to compare it to the word. Is this accurate? Is this scriptural? We're not supposed to sit back and say like, well, my goodness, who am I to, to question what you're telling me? No, um, we're commanded to, we're responsible for what we receive and what we believe. And so we're responsible between us and God. I'll get to that more here in a little bit. Again, you're not judging the other person. We're judging what they're saying. And it isn't all or nothing. It's not like you're either 100% right or you're 100% wrong, right? If you're wrong about one thing, you're a false prophet and a heretic and you're going to go to hell. That's not what this is talking about, right? It wouldn't tell us to judge it if it was impossible to get something wrong, right? I mean, just the implication, let, let, you know, when the prophet speaks, let two or three others judge what they're saying. So they, God wouldn't tell us to judge what people are saying if it wasn't possible to be mistaken or, or to kind of have to interpret exactly what something means and make sure that we're accurate about it. They could possibly be wrong. Even if they're a, a true prophet or someone truly flowing into the prophecy, there's ways we could be wrong. Maybe completely wrong, maybe partially wrong. Right? So there's a lot of different ways. Again, it's not all or nothing. Maybe part of the message is accurate, but maybe they're wrong. Maybe God gave them a sentence and they added a paragraph. So it's like maybe part of it was from God, but then they added their own uh, message and sermon to it, and that wasn't from God. Maybe they were right about part of it, but they were wrong about the timing. And so, so timing is a factor. Maybe they're right about part of it, but they're wrong about the application. You know, it's like, here's what God said and what you should do about it. And it's like, well, that actually was your own opinion. You know, you added it on by accident. Again, it, this is usually good motives. Maybe they were wrong, they were right about part of it, but they're wrong about the tone. And this is huge because depending on someone's doctrine or their mood, they can completely mess up the tone, right? Imagine God is saying lovingly, I love you and I want you to stop running from me. But then somebody gets it, and they have different doctrine, and so they, they interpret the tone differently, and they say, I only put up with you because I love you. Stop running from me, you rebel. Right? Yeah, they got some of the message right, but they completely changed the tone. They changed the whole style of what's being communicated. Again, just tone of voice can change a lot. You can say, I love you, and I love you. Or, oh, why do I love you? You know, and so maybe someone got part of the message right, but they, their own filter of what they think God is like is wrong, and so they're interpreting what God is saying the wrong way. So maybe the person giving you a word is filtering it through bad doctrine or through their emotions or, or through their own fears, their own bias. And so again, that's why we're supposed to judge it and say, okay, well, I think this is a word from God. I received that, but this other part, I don't think that was from God. And, you know, or I, you know, that doesn't sound scriptural. It doesn't sound like God's character, God's nature, so I'm not going to receive that part of it. And that's not, that's not wrong. It doesn't mean that they're a bad person. It just means it's our responsibility to judge words that we receive. Um, yeah, if part of it isn't scriptural, chop those parts off. If part of it blesses you, receive that. Um, you know, another example in scripture of this is 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. It says, 1 Corinthians 14, 3 says, But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. So if someone gives you a word and it causes fear, shame, condemnation, or confusion okay, something's off. You know, either they added something or we're, in, we're interpreting it incorrectly or something because that's not the fruit of what a word from God should bear. The fruit from, of a word from God, even if, it, you know, there's place for correction, there's place for warnings and, and things like that, but it should result in good fruit, not shame, not condemnation, not confusion, things like that. And so um, something's wrong if the fruit isn't right. And, it, and it maybe it's part of the word is still correct, but there's been some additions to it that, that are wrong. So the first one was to judge it. The second tip is that a word from God through someone else, a prophetic word should confirm, not control. And this is a really big one. This is really important and one that I've seen misused a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, you don't see any examples in the New Testament of a, prof of a prophet commanding someone what to do. 
saying you have to do this. Right? Let me show you a couple examples here. So Acts 11, verses 27 through 29, it, it talks about a prophet named Agabus. And so we'll jump right in. It says, In these days, prophets, a group of prophets, came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world. Right? So this was a worldwide word of prophecy. It wasn't for a specific person. It was for a group to be aware of. It says, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. The, verse 29, then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. And so the prophet said, this is going to happen. And that was it. He didn't say, and you must do this. It says, this is what's going to happen. And it says the disciples, and if you could pull back up verse 29, <clears throat> it says the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief. So they all decided for themselves what to do about it. The prophet said, this will happen. Thank you. We decide what we're going to do about it. And they each did it according to what they could. Maybe some were wealthy and could give a lot. Maybe some were poor and could give a little. But they decided on their own what to do. So the prophet wasn't controlling them. The prophet was making them aware of something, an opportunity. And they were like, yeah, I want to do something to bless our, our brethren who, who um, are going to suffer during this famine. And so we want to take care of them. Another example, it's also with Agabus. Acts chapter 21 verses 10 through 15. So it's a bit of a longer example, but it's, it's worthwhile. So Acts 21 verse 10 says, And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, or Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, because Paul was on his way to Jerusalem. So it says, He took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, right? This is a word from God. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. So he's basically saying, Paul, you're going, you know, you're going to be bound up like this. So verse 12 says, Now when he heard, so when Paul heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So the prophet said, if you go to Jerusalem, this will happen to you, right? So, yes, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. You'll be bound up and delivered to the Romans, essentially. And so Paul's friends said, so now, no, the prophet didn't say, you must do this, you must do that. He just said, this is what will happen. So Paul's friends said, this is a warning for you not to go. Please don't go, please don't go. God gave us a word so that you don't go. But Paul's saying, absolutely not. This is just letting me know I'm, I'm ready. This is to prepare my heart of what's going to happen, and I'm ready for it. I'm prepared. I'm willing to be bound. I'm willing to die. Because he knew in his spirit, right? See, God was putting in his heart to go to Jerusalem. <clears throat> so it was his choice. The prophet didn't get to tell him what to do. His friends didn't even get to tell him what to do. He's like, this is my choice. So again, you see a prophetic word. People can interpret it differently. The friends said, this word means don't go. And Paul said, no, this word means that I need to prepare my heart because this is going to happen and I'm okay with it. And so again, you don't see Paul being controlled by the word of prophecy. The word of prophecy was helpful to him. He's like, so again, you might say, you know, whoever wears this is going to be bound up and delivered to the Gentiles. You might say, well, that's not edification, exhortation, and comfort. Well, for Paul it was because for him it confirmed, I'm going and I have peace that I'm willing to pay this price. And so for him it actually bore good fruit. Even though it was a, of a negative thing that was going to happen, he's like, thanks for the heads up. I'm willing to do it. Jesus, I'm on board, and this is part of the plan. So he obviously had some kind of conviction of what he needed to do. So my point is that the prophetic word should confirm, not control. And too many people go around saying, I have a word from God. You should do this, and you need to do that, and you need to do that. And I've seen this stuff abused, and I've heard about it abused in horrible ways, right? People saying stuff like, you need to marry them, or even the other version of this. You need to divorce them. You need to move over here, and they need to move over there. And all kinds of stuff like that, right? You need to quit your job, or people even will go up to their pastor and say, God told me that I'm supposed to preach today instead of you. It's craziness. And so I've seen this kind of stuff abused all the time where people try to use the God card to justify manipulating people, saying, you need to do what I think you should do. And that's not how this works. It's not about control. See, here's the thing. <clears throat> Wait, let me make sure I'm not jumping ahead. Oh, yeah, one quick example of how this should work. So it should confirm where you're like, I, I feel like God's been telling me something. I'm pretty sure that this is what God's telling me. You get a word, and it's like, that confirms it. That's exactly what I thought. 
<clears throat> Other times it might be you don't realize you're hearing something and you get a prophetic word and you're like, you know what, now that you mention it, that, that does bear witness with me. And one, way, one example that might help you um, help explain how this works. I don't know if you've ever watched a movie you know, you're watching a movie at home and they say something and you're like, I didn't understand what they said because they kind of mumbled it or maybe the music was too loud. So you rewind, <coughs> sorry, and you're like, I still can't hear what they said. You know, I, I, I can't make out the words that they're saying. So you rewind, rewind. And so then you just turn on the subtitles. And so you turn on the subtitles and as soon as you read it, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's what they said. I couldn't hear it clearly myself, but now that I read it, I, I, I can hear it with my ears now because now I know what to listen for. A prophetic word can be very similar, where it's, it's basically helping confirm, like, oh, now that I hear it through you, yeah, that is what God's been telling me this whole time. And so it should be confirming something that God's already speaking to us. If it's true, God's already speaking it to you, and the prophetic word is helping you. It's helping you um, become aware of something that you weren't noticing or weren't hearing clearly, something like that. And so, again, that's part of why they're so helpful. You know, I heard someone say once, you know, if a prophet tells you to move to the other side of the world and to become a missionary, take them with you. Because otherwise, how do you know when to go back home? Right? See, if you need someone else to control you and tell you what to do, and this is what God is telling you to do, and that's what God's telling you to do, and all that, you're saying, okay, well, now I depend on you instead of depending on God. Because, again, if you make major life choices through a word and you have no internal confirmation, <clears throat> that's very dangerous because we all have the ability to hear God. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So we all, we all are responsible for hearing God for ourselves. And prophetic words are fantastic blessings, but they should confirm. <clears throat> if it doesn't confirm, just put it on the shelf. Say, maybe down the road, this word will make sense, or maybe it won't, but I'm not gonna revolve my life around it if it doesn't bear witness in me. I'm gonna keep following God. I'll pray about it if it sounds like it could possibly be true, but um, maybe the timing's off, or maybe this is a word that I'll remember in 20 years and it'll really bless me, something like that. See, here, here's why this is really important. First Timothy, 2 verse 5 says, For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, <clears throat> the man Jesus Christ. Sorry, the man Christ Jesus. See, there's one mediator between us and the Father, and that's Jesus. We should never allow another person to become another mediator between us and God. And that's what can happen sometimes if people get intimidated by someone who's prophetic or something like that, is basically sometimes people unintentionally or intentionally are trying to make themselves a mediator and saying, I hear God, you can't, I'm special, you're not, you need to listen to me. And that's the relationship we should have with Jesus, not with any other human, right? Is that, no, there's no more mediators. We don't need an earthly priesthood, we have Jesus. He's our, he's our, he's our priest, he's our mediator. And so we should be hearing God and not just having somebody else saying, I heard God for you and you need to do what God just said. And who cares if you believe me or not, you just need to obey me. And basically that's turning them into a mediator and that shouldn't be our relationship with God. God wants us to minister to each other. God wants us to bless each other. He put, you know, apostles, prophets, you know, pastors, teachers, evangelists in the body to, as a blessing. So he want, there are leadership structures involved. But in our, in our relationship with God, it's between us and God. So there shouldn't be a mediator between how we hear God. There should be people helping us, but not controlling us. So again, the first one is to judge words. The second one is that words should confirm, not control. They shouldn't be manipulating us and controlling us. They should be confirming things and reinforcing what we're hearing from God already. And the third one, so my last tip for you all right now is that it should, a word from, when you hear a prophetic word for you, it should reflect how God sees you. This kind of ties into the first one. I just wanted to go more in depth, but it should reflect the way that God sees you. I right, see if you're born again, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. You're pure, you're righteous, you're holy. You've been glorified in the spirit. Your spirit is as perfect as Jesus is. Now your soul still is being, is still being um, sanctified as, as we live in this life, but your spirit's perfect. <clears throat> God loves you. God's not angry at you. God can look at you and not want to destroy you because you're a new creation, right? He, he's, it's not a holy God and an unholy you or God is light in your darkness. It's no, God is light in your light. God is holy in your holy because he made you a new creation in the, in the image of Jesus. <clears throat> so... If a prophetic word talks to you as if you're garbage, that's not how God sees you. A prophetic word should be flowing from God through that person to you. So why would God tell them that he doesn't like you? Why would God be angry at you? Why would God talk about you as if you're garbage? That's not how God sees you. So a word from God shouldn't sound like that. And so when God looks at you, he sees you as holy, pure, beautiful. So if a word doesn't reflect that, 
th then something's off. There's a misunderstanding about the new covenant. So let me see here real quick. Um, yeah, we need to understand the new covenant. That's part of taking things back to the word is understanding what God has done and who we are and how God has made us. You know, some people think that prophets or the gift of prophecy is tied to being cranky and angry. Like, oh man, they see what's wrong with everybody. They're prophetic. That's not prophetic, right? If you always see people the way, you know, in their, at their worst, you see what's wrong with people, you're seeing things through the eyes of the accuser because you're seeing, right? The accuser is the one who looks at you and sees everything that's wrong with you. He likes to point it out. <clears throat> and the accuser um, is, is the devil. Do you want to be a prophet for the devil or a prophet for God? If all you're doing is telling people what's wrong with them and pointing out their flaws and, and focusing on their soul, then, then you're not in, in agreement with how God sees them. Now, again, I'm not saying that there's never a place for correction or, or things like that, but it's always still from a loving father calling people back, right? You're walking away from me. Come back to me. You're, you're not walking in your true identity. Come back to me. <clears throat> things like that. But if it's just kind of, let me read your mail and tell you all your sin and all the things I'm unhappy about and blah, 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 and I'm going to rain judgment on you and all this stuff. See, they're being inspired by the Old Covenant, but we're not under that covenant. See, the Old Testament prophets were speaking on behalf of God, and back then the Old Covenant was reality. When God looked at people, it was repent or die. And so the prophets were very harsh because it was a very harsh covenant, but it was reflecting God's heart where God's saying, repent or die, but please repent. I don't, I don't want you to die. Come back to me. Come back to me. I want to bless you. Stop turning away from me. But <clears throat> if you don't repent, you're going to die. Because it is different time and season. Again, um, if you study the timeline, you know there, there's a reason for why God treated people differently at different seasons. It was all it, it was all part of the master plan to save us because He's loved us all along. It's not like He was angry at us and then finally He decided to love us. He's loved us all along. So again, if if somebody thinks they're prophetic and so they model themselves after the Old Testament, they're miss, missing the point because the point isn't to rain down judgment on people and to call out everybody's sin and to shame people and all this stuff. It's, no, I'm under new covenant, so if I'm speaking on behalf of God, it should reflect how God sees you. And so, how does God see me? Well, the way he sees me is different than the way he saw people in the old covenant. Because I'm a new creation, they weren't. So prophetic words should reflect that. So, John 3, 16. Uh, you may not be aware of this scripture, but it's a really good one. <laughs> Just kidding. But John 3, 16 says, um, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, God so loved the world. Didn't say God so loved Christians. He loved the world while they were still sinners. So it wasn't about, you know, oh, I'm, God's not up there angry, kind of like, I just want to kill sinners, and I hate sinners, and they make me so angry, and I'm just so mad at them. It's like, no, he poured out his wrath on Jesus. He loves sinners. He wants them to repent. He wants them to turn to Christ and become new creations. So he's not just saying, I love your sin and stay the way you are. He's saying, I love you so much. I want you to believe in Christ so that you don't perish. Because if you don't, you will perish. I don't want that. So come, you know, into everlasting life. So again, God has a loving heart. He's not looking for opportunities to kill people. He's looking for opportunities to save people. You know, if you want to go more in depth on this, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you can listen to Andrew's uh, series on the true nature of God. It's powerful. You know, understanding God's true nature, what he's really like, what he's actually after. So God loves people. He's, he's the one trying to save us from destruction, not the one trying to destroy us. And a lot of people who say that they're prophetic or they're prophets and stuff are saying, God sees your sin and he's going to rain down hurricanes and tornadoes and, and earthquakes and all this stuff. And that God's just so angry that he's, just, he's had it. He just wants to wipe you out. And that city's going to get destroyed and that city's going to get destroyed. That is not new, new covenant prophecy. That's people modeling themselves after the old covenant and they don't realize um, that's not how God sees people. He sees people as his lost children that he loves and wants to save. Again, he poured out his wrath on Jesus, and he's not going to pour out wrath again until, you know, end of, end of the world, where it's like, okay, time to wrap things up, and that's a different topic. Um, but again, it should reflect the covenant that we're in. So if you receive a prophetic word that sounds like the old covenant, like I said, judge it. Is this scriptural? Does this reflect reality? Does this reflect who I am in the spirit? Does this reflect who God is? The whole deal. You know, once someone told me, they came up to me and said, I just received a word. Someone gave me a prophetic word where God said that he's going to kill one of my family members and I'm going to go through like horrible sickness and, and abuse and all these terrible situations, but I'll learn something at the end of it. And I was like, well, don't receive that. That's not, that's not how God sees you. I don't know, you know, that doesn't sound like a word from God at all. I know him. That's not what he's like. You know, I've heard other people say, oh yeah, God told me how much he just hates me and doesn't like me and he's just been so frustrated with me and for years and years he's so mad at me and he's about to give up. 
And I was like, that's not God's voice. Filter it through the word. Say, is this how God sees me based on the word? Is this, is this, does this reflect the reality of who I am as a new creation in Christ? So, again, these are three basic warnings is that you should judge words. You're commanded to. It's not just that it's okay to judge them. It's that it's not okay not to judge them. You're supposed to say, is this scriptural? Is this godly? So judge the words. They should confirm, not control. And then it should reflect the covenant that we're in. It should reflect the reality that we're in, reflect God's heart toward you and who you are. So I hope this is helpful. And uh, again, uh, like I say, after this, I'll probably go back to more topics that are more proactive of things that we can do that are exciting and fun, ways to know God more and enjoy Him more and walk in victory more. But some of these things, um, I've seen people set free by finding out what the Word says about some of these things. And so to me, this is very important. And again, hope it's a blessing. We'll do as much Q&A as we can, and then we'll move on. So um, yeah, let's see. Let me get a drink real quick. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's see, Monica on YouTube. I go to a local church where I hear people who are not pastors teach the Word. They teach us to be holy enough in order to receive God's blessings. Will we still get blessings if we aren't living as holy? Okay, so um, I'm not sure what the first part. So again, uh, not all, pa pastors aren't the only ones allowed to teach. You know, there's teaching gifts that many people can minister to other people. And so uh, that's fine. But if someone's teaching that you have to be holy enough to receive God's blessings, th that, is, that is not accurate. God's blessings are in Christ. Now, now the problem, see, see, there's nuance to it because see, if we live unholy lives and especially unrepentant lives, if, we, if we're not just making mistakes and then we're trying to, to walk in, our, in the spirit, but if we're just knowingly walking in sin and not repentant about it, we are hardening our hearts. And if we harden our hearts, we're less sensitive to God. If we're less sensitive to God, we'll receive less from him. So indirectly, yes, if you're living an intentionally unholy life, you're hardening your heart to God and you will receive less from him. However, God's blessings are not tied to your holiness. God's blessings are this, they're all in Jesus. So the same way you receive Jesus is the same way you receive God's blessings because Jesus contains them. So you don't earn it by serving. You don't earn it by being holy. You don't earn it by, by tithing. You don't earn it by anything. It's all the blessings of God are in Christ. You receive them by faith. It's a free gift. You can't earn it. And trying to earn it is just a very harmful mindset because now we're saying, I have to earn blessings. I have to earn God's protection. I have to earn God's promises. No, these are free gifts. We receive them by faith. It's just grace. But having said that, if we're intentionally running away from God, then we're going to miss out on things. And so, again, it's a free gift. We can't earn it. If we had to earn it, no one would earn it. No one's good enough. No one can maintain it. And so, um, yeah, hope that's helpful. <clears throat> again, not everyone understands that nuance. And so they just say, blanket statement, if you're sinning, bad things will happen. And it's like, well, no, it's not that you're earning the sin either, right? It's like, well, no, you reap what you sow, but we're in a different covenant. We get blessings. Um, but indirectly, yes, if you start opening the door to certain things, then, then you're positioning yourself um, in the wrong way. But it's not about our actions earning things. It's really, you know, God gives grace to the humble. Let, let me back up and say it that way. So if you step out of humility, you're, you're stepping out of, of where the grace is going. And humility is about agreeing with God, being in sync with God, receiving things as a free gift, not about earning things. So, uh, yeah, I hope that's helpful. Uh, Isabel on YouTube, is it a sin to feel sad? I would say, depends what kind, what you mean by sad. If your sadness is based on um, self-indulgence, self-centeredness, lack of faith, right? Anything not of faith is sin. So if it's, I feel sad because I don't trust God, then yes, that's stepping into the flesh. And so that's sin in that sense. And I'm not saying that it's sin that disqualifies you um, from God or that he's mad at you or doesn't love you or anything like that, but it is something we need to repent from as in turn around. However, God's the one who invented emotions. You know, so emotions in and of themselves aren't bad and emotions should, should flow. You know, like God, we want God's emotions flowing through us. And even Jesus wept, right? So, so being sad in and of itself is not, if it's not, if it's not um, the result of a lack of faith and not trusting God and being self-centered, there's a good version of sadness where basically it's, this should not have happened. I'm not happy that this happened. This grieves me that this happened in a, in a godly way of kind of just, again, Jesus wept because he saw just how lost people were and how much they needed him and how just they were so scattered and stuff. And so emotions uh, aren't something that you, you need to 
feel bad about, right? I'm sad that I'm sad. Now I'm sad that I'm sad that I'm, you know, right? It's like, oh, I feel guilty. Now I'm guilty that I feel, anyway, it just becomes a cycle forever. And you don't want to live decades of your life just trying to repent for um, natural human emotion <clears throat> that, that aren't necessarily, um, that are just flowing from normal life. Again, so to me, like we shouldn't be happy about bad things happening, right? You know, and uh, this is a different topic, but we were not designed to experience death and we were not designed to experience rejection. God never intended us to experience these things. So he didn't design us to experience these things. That's why it can feel so overwhelming and we can feel so helpless when we experience a death of a loved one or we experience rejection of someone that we cared about, <clears throat> or even if we didn't care about them sometimes. The, the reason why those things hurt so much and they, they are so hard to wrap our minds around is because we weren't supposed to ever experience that. There's no silver lining to it other than in eternity. <clears throat> but in and of itself, this was not something that God ever wanted us to experience. Some people say, well, death is what gives beauty to life. That's not true. Life is beautiful on its own. God doesn't need death to be beautiful and for life to be amazing. And so, um, again, there, there's a godly sadness where it's just, this, this isn't a good thing that happened, and I wish it hadn't happened. But does it, is it going to turn into something negative, or is it going to turn into something positive of us turning to God or turning away from God? So I hope that's helpful. Uh, let's see, let's see. So, again, I can't screen these as much, so I don't know yet if I... I can't tell in advance if I know an answer or not, so I might ask a question and then say, I have no idea. So, uh, I can't read this name. B.G. Morrissey, M Morrissey um, on YouTube. Are prophets necessary in the New Covenant? Since we now have the Holy Spirit inside of us, leading us to all truth, do we need prophets in order to live sanctified lives? So, it depends what you mean by necessary. So, yes, we have the Holy Spirit, um, but prophets, so you can get by without any of God's gifts. However, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors are all gifts to the body given by Jesus to bless us. And then the gifts of the Spirit are gifts to the body in each of us, every single person. Not everybody's called to the fivefold ministry, but everybody has gifts of the Spirit inside of them to bless others. Now, you don't need them. None of them are necessary, but they're all necessary to live um, in abundance and to experience the fullness of Christ in this world. So same thing, it's kind of, do we need teachers? If we have the Bible and we have the Holy Spirit, we don't need them, but you'll learn a lot more if you learn from others. Everybody will, right? Iron sharpens iron. So same thing. I can hear God. Why do I need a prophetic word? Well, I don't need a prophetic word from someone else, but it's there to bless me. And so, again, did, did Paul need to know, hey, you'll be bound up if you go to Jerusalem? No, he didn't need to know that. He would have been fine either way, but that helped him be even better. He's like, okay, now I'm even more prepared for it. I won't be surprised. It won't catch me off guard. That, that it's going to be tough, I'm ready for it. And so, again, we don't need it, but it's nice. It's a blessing. Again, it's great to receive from other people. Again, you could say this with everything. I talk about this in healing also where, you know, we don't need gifts of healing because we can receive healing on our own. But it's nice that other people have gifts of healing where we can receive from other people also. So it, it's like with that with everything. We can get everything from God on our own, but it's not the most effective way. It's kind of like... Um, you know, I could make a mug on my own. It'd probably take me years and years and years to figure out how to get the ingredients and how to make them and how to mold it and how to make the equipment and how to paint it and all that kind of stuff. So if I had no help from anybody else, someday I could make one of these by myself from scratch. But I'd much rather just buy one from someone else who's already made it. And so again, we don't need others, but others are a blessing from God. And so um, again, yeah, to me it's I'd rather not miss out on God's best just because I don't need God's best. I can get by with less. God's so good that even if we only get a fraction of what he has for us, it's mind-blowing. But to me, I'm like, just because that's amazing, I'm like, I want to find out how amazing life can be and what God's shown me. I used to want to be a lone wolf, and I was like, I just want me and God, people just slow me down. And for years and years and years, that was my mindset. I'm not going to open up with anyone. I'm just going to spend time with God, enjoy God, everything I'll get on my own. And God told me, you're missing out. That's not how I designed you. I designed you for relationship. So I uh, hope that's helpful. Let's see. Um, so Essie on YouTube, what do you think of the growth of New Age Christianity? I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. I know what New Age is. I know what Christianity is. Um, but I'd say there's always going to be counterfeits. There's always going to be things that take something true and mix it with something else and it morph morphs into something weird. And so that's been happening since the, the, the apostles. And so, I mean, even in the Old Testament, it happened with 
with uh, the old covenant is you had people create different variations and mix the truth with lies. And so we just need to be sensitive. That's why we need to be grounded in the word and go back to the word and not just get caught up in what someone else is, is saying or doing. Um, we can't just believe somebody because we think they're more spiritual than us or, oh, wow, they act so weird. They must have the Holy Spirit more than me. Oh, they act so smart. They must know the word more than me. We, we all are responsible for going to the word ourselves and learning. Um, so again, I'm, I'm a huge fan of receiving from others, but ultimately I'm responsible for, for my relationship with God. So I need to go to the word so that I'm not just blown around by every wind of doctrine. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Usha or Usha on YouTube. How should one speak to friends when they're using God, the God card for making their own, own life decisions? I think I should let them reap the consequences and be quiet while others, another side of me says I should rescue them. Depends. Right? So here is, you need wisdom in relationships. Anything with this, and a lot of times people will say, well, God told me, so I'm going to do it, and I don't care what you say. And so they might close the door. Now, you know that it's okay that you are actually allowed to say, why well, I disagree. If just because you said God told you to do this. Um, you know, I've, you know we've, we all know people, maybe we've done it ourselves, where we make God sound very indecisive. Well, God told me this. Never mind, God told me that. Actually, God changed his mind. I'm doing that instead. And it's like, wow, God sure is confused. Well, no, it's just people with good intentions trying and, you know, maybe being a bit too flippant about saying God told me or, you know, maybe good intentions, but just kind of throwing it out there for every single thought that they ever have. So again, when, it with, 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 when it's with someone else's life decisions, it depends on your relationship with them, on how much access you have and how much access they're giving you. So you might have access to say, I disagree. And now what I'm sharing with you might be able to help and say, Listen, I know that you're convinced that God told you this, but the word says we should judge prophetic words. We should judge words from God and make sure it's aligned. Maybe you're right about what God said, but maybe you're wrong about the timing. Maybe you're wrong about the application. Maybe you're wrong about the tone. Maybe you're wrong about um, whatever detail. Maybe you added a little bit, and so you got part of it wrong. So if you have access, maybe you could share something like that. But it's all about relationship. So sometimes we have to sit back and just watch and be ready to help them get back up when they mess up. And so... Uh, yeah, relationships are tricky because, again, we don't want to say, I know better than you, so I need to try and control you. We don't want to, you know, that's kind of what I was warning before, is that sometimes people use the God card to, to manipulate and say, you must do this. And, and again, the easiest way to change someone's behavior is through guilt, shame, fear. You know, if you do this, you're bad. If you don't do this, I'm more holy than you, so you should listen to me. But that's not how we really want people to change. We don't want to change people through external pressure we want them to, to change internally. There's balance, right? I, I don't let my toddler decide what they eat for dinner. You know, I don't let my toddler decide if they play with a knife. You know, at, at certain stages in life, we do need someone to protect us from ourselves. Um, but again, it's not through manipulation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's see, let's see. Um, Tim and Lauren on YouTube, when you hear a word in your mind, so I guess personally receiving a word from God, is there a checklist to go through before confirming it was from God? Especially for specific prompts, for example, if I start, if I hear from God, start a business. It's a great question. I'd say it's very similar, but I'd add a little bit more to it. So again, is this scriptural? Obviously, start a business. Um, th that's too, too a specific Sometimes it might be God, sometimes it might not be God. There's nothing unscriptural about starting a business. <clears throat> um, and so I would go through the same list, though. Is this scriptural? I wouldn't worry about the, is this manipulating me? But is, what's this motivated by? Is this motivated by, by guilt, by pressure, by, by desire, by excitement, things like that? Um, does this reflect the new covenant? You know, does this sound like something that God, you know, based on who, what I know about God, does this sound like something he might lead me to do? Because, again, if you think God doesn't like you, you'll hear him differently. If you, if you know God does love you and like you, you'll, you'll hear things differently. I, I'd also go into um, a bit more, you know, God speaks to us through our desires. You know, the more clearly we hear God, the more we're walking in righteousness and holiness and who we are in the spirit, the more easy it is to trust and say, if this is a desire in my heart, and, and when I think about it, it makes me and God excited together about it, we go for it. And so a lot of times it's, you know, do I have peace about it? And, and Again, um, a few years ago, actually probably now it's like four years ago, I have a message called The Key to Everything. It's my very first live Bible study. I'd, I'd go back and listen to that one if you're interested about how to hear God more clearly. I have a few different messages on that. But basically, yeah, when you're hearing God, it's okay. 
am I excited about this? Do, do I feel at peace about this? Do I, you know, and trusting, if this isn't from God, he'll stop me. You know, he'll give me a check in my spirit if this isn't from him. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, that's kind of the mental checklist is kind of, does it sound like it's from God? Is this biblical? Am I excited about this? Am I excited about this with God? And, and okay, let's go for it. And then I trust if I'm wrong, he'll stop me. So that's all the time we have. I uh, hope this has been a blessing to you. And I hope you have a, an amazing weekend. I'll see you all sometime soon. And uh, yeah, take care. I'll see you soon. I'd like to give you a special invitation to join me on March the 7th through the 9th for our men's advance. We're going to have Jeremy Pearson speaking. He's a powerful minister and also Todd White. And then we'll also have myself and some of our staff here. And we've been doing these men's advances for over a decade and we have seen people's lives changed. I would really encourage you, especially you ladies, send your husbands, send your kids. We've seen people's lives changed and I promise you it'd be a blessing. So check it out. March the 7th through the 9th, our men's advance in Woodland Park, Colorado. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV.